Welcome back, CBS class. We're going to sing the next song. We are one in the spirit if you want to worship with us and stand up. Thanks, what a great song for this lesson. Let's pray. Happy New Year before I do. Welcome back in May 2022. Shine bright for all of us. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you and we thank you for the privilege of being able to do this. To be able to come and study your word. To worship and to demonstrate to the world that you are God. We pray for your presence to be with us. Help us to understand, even today, what Peter was writing 2,000 years ago. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. In this week's lesson, Peter is instructing the followers of Jesus how to live a righteous and holy life in a brutal pagan society. A society that considered them as atheists because they didn't believe in the many gods. They believed in one God. How things change in 2,000 years. They were brutally persecuted for that. As followers of Jesus, Peter instructed them to honor the king and government officials, obey civil laws, all the while live in a righteous and holy life. This is the same calling that we have today. And remember when Peter wrote this 2,000 years ago, Nero was Caesar. 
of Rome. It's mind-boggling how he wrote these words to us. But we are called to live as he instructed us because he said this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. So it's not an option. It's a tall order and not easy to do. But when we do it, light will shine in darkness and God will be glorified. This is our calling. People will take notice when we walk in the footsteps of Messiah Jesus. All right, I broke this up into three. We are called to walk in purity. We are in the, like I said before, we are in the same position as the people in Peter's day. We live in a world that's subject to governments and a national, regional, state, and even local level. As citizens of this country, of living in Minnesota, we're subject to them. But, as Peter said, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. We today, technically speaking, are sojourners and exiles because our citizenship, yes, it is, we are Americans, and yes, we are living in the state of Minnesota, but our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. When we said yes to Jesus, we took on that citizenship. So we are strangers and sojourners in this world. It's really hard to get your head wrapped around the reality of this, but that's how, that's who we are. That's how, what we have to live for. Let me, and this is so important. So important that Peter talked to us about it, Paul talked to us about it, Jesus talked to us about it. So what does it say? In Ephesians 2, 11 and 13, I think it puts it out really clear. Because I think you need to understand this. Then you'll understand what Peter is saying. I think sometimes today, 2,000 years removed, and most of the church being Gentiles, they don't grasp what chosen means. Therefore, keep in mind that once you, Gentiles in the flesh, were called on circumcision by those called circumcision, which is performed on the flesh by hand. At that time, you were separate from the Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, but having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Jesus, you who once were far off have, brought, have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. That's why Peter writes in verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter was writing basically to Jews, but at the same time, wow, once again I'm screwed up. But anyway, once again, he, he was writing to Jews, but he didn't view the Gentiles in the church as Gentiles. Why? Because now they were part of the commonwealth of Israel. And what did that mean? By saying yes to Jesus and receiving his sacrificial blood for their sins, they were now part of the commonwealth of Israel. Jews at that time... And that day would make sure their conduct 
was different amongst the Gentiles because they know they were always under scrutiny wherever they lived. So, there's only two classes of people in the Bible. Jews or Gentiles. They weren't concerned with black, brown, whatever other color people can be. They were concerned about one thing. Jews and Gentiles. Israel, the Jewish people, were chosen by God. That's what we get in Deuteronomy 7. There's a specialness about that. The Jewish people aren't special, and that's why God chose them. They're special because God chose them. Does that make sense? And now Gentiles are grafted into that truth. When I was 10 years old, my grandmother sat me down and told me that we're Jews, we're God's chosen people, and told me the responsibility I had as a Jew. We're separate from the world. We have a different code of conduct from the world. And those Gentiles who said yes to Jesus are part of that commonwealth now. You are chosen by God. Isn't that an awesome thought? But because you are, now you have to walk in a manner of that. It calls, we don't march to the beat of the drums. Back in those days when Peter wrote, the Jews were good citizens. They obeyed the laws of whatever country they're in. In fact, if you go and read Jeremiah 29, uh, when Israel was in ex Judah was in exile in Babylon, God told them, be part of the society. Follow the rules. Remember who God is. Live and prosper that community. That's the marching orders Jews have. And that's the marching orders we have, and that's what Peter is telling. Because this is, your notes will say, your commentary will say first generation. I would say first and second, maybe even starting the third. It's 35 years since Jesus was ascended into the heavens. Approximately 35 years. So what does that mean to us? It means that we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. You know, Jesus kept all the religious laws. He kept them, the biblical religious laws. He pushed back on man-made laws, but he was still righteous on the biblical laws. If you read the Bible, he hit every single one of the mandated Feast to be in Jerusalem, every single one. So he kept, he didn't come to turn the order upside down. He came to live in submission. Let me illustrate a point. I read this article last week and I, when I was wrestling with this uh, lesson. It's from Christianity Today. And I think it sums up what it means to be part of the commonwealth Part and walking in the footsteps of Jesus in a hostile land. We think, some of us think that the United States is a hostile land towards Christianity. You know, you're not off base on it, but here's where it's really hostile. A Muslim man walked into the offices of a Christian pastor whose congregation is in Lebanon's Bika Valley who has been serving Syrian refugees since the outbreak of the Civil War. Not an easy place. They were citizens working with the citizens there, following their laws, but they were working for the Lord. The Muslim guy goes on. I hated you for the past eight years, the Muslim said. I've tried to turn my community against you. But three months ago, it was your American doctors who treated me and paid for my hospital stay. We hate these people, he continued, yet they have come here and show us love. Tell me the time of your services. I want to follow Jesus. How great is that? 
And that keeps going on. I'll read one more. A second pastor has described how a Syrian confessed that he had started to come to church to kill him. Let me just back up. If you're not following the civil laws of that area, you won't even make it that far as a church, as a Christian, because they're going to come and arrest you. They're looking for it. But if you're following their civil laws and you're, you have the integrity to do that, they're going to have to go to another means. And that's where the, uh, the Syrian confessed that he started coming to church to kill him. Now a believer, the man serves other refugees as a member of the congregation. A third says his one small Christian fellowship has grown to more than 1,500, largely due to converted refugees. Perhaps as many as 10% of them are former extremists. They saw a quality of life in a very difficult situation. They saw a love that shattered their worldview. That is the power of walking in the footsteps of Messiah Jesus. People notice and lives are changed. This is the point Peter is making. When he calls us to walk as a, a holy nation, to be honorable so that Gentiles see it and they're convicted. That's what we're called to do. The kingdom of God is advancing in the most hellish areas in the world because they are obedient to the word and to the commands, even the commands that Peter is saying to do. The kingdom of God is advancing. Its glory is shining bright in a dark and dangerous world. Again, to my central point, people will take notice when we walk in the footsteps of Messiah Jesus. The question is, are we up to that calling? Will we do it? Will we put aside our desires, our flesh, to serve the living God? We're called to walk in humility. Peter goes on, and this is one I'm sure a lot of people choked on. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So the, it, it keeps going. It, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Living as servants of God. Living free. We're free to choose to serve God. We're free to do that. And to do that, we have to walk in integrity and honor and obey the word of God. So, what happens if civil laws violate God's law? The Bible has something to say about that, but understand this. Because you don't like a president or you don't like a governor or you don't like whatever, you're still called to pray for him. Peter prayed for Nero. Paul prayed for Nero. How do you do that? It's because we live in another kingdom. We live in the kingdom of God. From Matthew, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 27, and I abbreviated. It says, he was challenged, should you pay taxes or not? by those trying to set a trap. And Jesus said, uh, he took out a coin. Whose inscription's on the coin? And it was Caesar's, they said. Then pay to Caesar the things that's Caesar's and to God the things that are God. You can live in an ungodly society and still be true to the Lord. 
We've got all kinds of laws that we can obey and still be true to the Lord. I was at church in July of 2020, the first time back since the shutdown. And the requirement is you had to keep all, you know, the distances that have gone away. You had to wear a mask. My wife, Marcia, stayed home with uh, our grandkids, and I went by myself. And I got to tell you, it was hard wearing that mask. It was, I told her later, it was the most lonely experience that I've ever had in a church. Everybody away, I was by myself, masked, couldn't see anybody smile, maybe they're frowning at me. I didn't want to wear that mask. And I know there were members of the church who would not wear it because it was against what they believed was right. If we can't submit to our own church leaders, how are we ever going to submit to a government? And guess what? If we don't, it's a sin. Because that's what Peter said. It's the will of God for us. It's hard, but it's not about me. Nothing about that mask was ungodly. Nothing about it compliment, uh, um, compromised my faith. But it was a rule. And the church was trying to be good citizens by following the rules. That's what we're called to do. That's a trite thing. That's not hard to do. Let me tell you when it gets really hard to do. My middle daughter, I might have told this a few years ago, my middle daughter is a teacher in a senior high, a little ways away from here. And they have a hard and fast rule. You cannot share your faith in Jesus with anyone. Zero tolerance. If you do, you're fired. You're fired. Now she has to teach, she's science, so she teaches evo- evolution as a theory because she has to. But she tells the kids it's a theory. So she f- follows the rule. And she's a rule based person. She's a coach. And when she uh, used to tell her players to do something, she expected it to be done. And she didn't really give them a lot of wiggle room. Here's where God's law and man's law come into a collision. She's walking down the the hall one day and she noticed this young lady, young girl in the senior high who looked really obviously distressed. So she went up to her and said, are you okay? And the girl was crying So she said, let's go into my room and we can talk. And the girl says, I live with no hope. I don't know how I can keep going. And my daughter shared her faith, knowing that if this girl turned her in, she'd lose her job, and she needs her job. But she felt she has the freedom as a follower of Jesus to share a faith if somebody's in distress. So she did. I don't know everything she said. They shared back and forth. Two weeks later, she ran into the girl again, and she said, well, how are you doing? And she said to my daughter, I was on my way to kill myself, and you gave me hope. And this girl has turned her life around. She's now walking with the Lord. A week later, she's called into the principal's office because of the girl. The principal did not ask her what she said. She just said, the principal just told my daughter, the student put you up for teacher of the year. He didn't ask any questions, whether he knew or whether he didn't. I don't know, but God protects those who are obedient. She's a rule follower, but at the same time, she shared her faith. That's how we do it. They can't legislate how we believe, but they can on laws that we need to obey. Being a citizen in the kingdom of God is not about us. It really isn't about us. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the commonwealth that we're all grafted into, the kingdom of God. When we live our lives before God in that way, people will see 
and it will be attracted. Like the Muslims who wanted to kill the Christians, they saw they walked in a way that was different. People will take notice when we walk in the footsteps of Messiah Jesus and God is glorified, so his light shines. Let me end with this. That was my New Year's resolution to get out on time and I failed. <laughs> Three days in and I failed. <laughs> Peter goes on and reminds us the price Jesus paid for us. The demonstration, though he was reviled, he didn't revile back. Though they, he told, they told lies about him, he stood on the truth. He didn't fight back because his eyes weren't on himself. They were on his father. He had a mission. He committed no sin. Neither was there deceit in his mouth. So he didn't argue with them. He just lived the life. And thank God he did. It cost him his life. But because it cost him his life, we get to live. He who did not sin became sin for us. It's a great deal. And he quotes from Isaiah 53. He bore our sins. He, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. Then let's walk as healed people. Let's live as healed, as healed people. That means... Let's submit to the authorities that are over us without compromising our faith. End with this story. In the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, up until recently, if you were a Jew that believed in Jesus, you couldn't go above a certain rank. You could not be in the intelligence division. You could not lead a platoon. If they could have kept you out of combat, they would have. But the quality of these young Israelis, second generation, they were sabras. They had to deal with them. They couldn't kick them out of the country because the only passports they had were Israeli passports, and they were now in the Israeli Defense Force. They got every bad job you could get in the armed services, yet they obeyed it, and they walked and the quality of their service was so great that now the floodgates have opened. They can hold any position, and even the highest, most secret one, because of the quality of their lives and their witness. In fact, they even instituted every quarter or every six months, is when you're on service, you get a week I think it's a long weekend, like we call a long weekend, Thursday to a Monday coming back, where they can go and they can have a religious service and they can share their faith. Why? Because they saw the quality of their service. And in 2012, 20, excuse me, 2014 in the Gaza War, the first Messianic Jew serving in the IDF since 1948, died in battle. He was killed in battle. At his funeral, there was over 10,000 people. The army asked if the head rabbi, who was an unbeliever in Jesus, could preside over the service. And the congregation said, yes. Jewish pastor, Arab uh, associate pastor, they allowed them to do it, and then they got to share. That's what calls, that's what we're, Peter's talking about. You got to submit to the authorities. They could have said no, but 10,000 came because of the quality of these people's walk, these young men and women. The light shines if we're willing to submit and walk in the footsteps of Jesus, the question is, are we willing to do that? The world will take notice. They'll sit up 
and they'll say, who are these people? When we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and guess what? We're not going to be glorified. The God we serve will be. Are we up to the call? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that Peter, living in a brutal day, could write these words and live them. Because even in his death, his light shined and the world exploded and the church grew because people saw something so utterly different than the miserable lives they were leaving, living without the Lord. So help us to have that call in our lives. Help us to understand that. Lord, help us not to make it about us, but about you, and remind us that we are citizens of your kingdom, and we obey your laws and your desires. Give us the strength to do that. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.